That is really a great score, Alexander. And I, I'm wondering what uh, what sound set that you used on this. Um, it, it's it has some very nice colors in it, uh, but it tends to uh, make brass and lower winds sound almost uh, like an accordion. Now, there are a few places in this score where you you have some scoring in the winds that really will sound like an accordion, and I will point those out when we get to them. For instance, you are quite fond of scoring clarinets in octaves, and there are a couple of places where uh, that relationship is very exposed without much string doubling or or uh, the the um, accordionness of it is accentuated by some of the doubling choices by the other winds. And I'll point that out when we get there. And that really will sound accordion-like. However, um, the, uh, the octaves that you have scored in some of the lower brass and lower strings and so on, they shouldn't sound that much like an accordion. They, they, they really, you know, so I would say like maybe look into some possible alternatives. I, I don't think this is note performer. I think note performer would give you a more realistic sound for some things, maybe less for others. Uh, here you've got a, a separation in your uh, in your bar lines between the horns and the heavy brass. Don't do that. I would say whatever the bracket is on the left side, it should be the uh, the group in the same bar line going forwards. Okay. Uh, I mean, I understand the rationale of looking at the horns as a separate uh, sort of group within a group or section within a section. But still, I, I, I just really, really prefer to have a more standard approach there. I would say on these opening pages, even though there might be a lot going on vertically speaking, try to mention all the instruments just for the score reader, if nothing else, and for your conductor and so on. For instance, it would have been really nice here to read that you've got timpani and bassoons and so on. All right, so let's just jump straight into the evaluation criteria. And starting off with the, you know, some of the concerns, pitch weight in the upper middle register of the piano, that's not a big concern. You're not limiting yourself. It's, it's not a direct transcription of the score. So, um, so you are broadening your orchestral palette, your, your range of pitches, and that's, that's very wise, I feel. Um, thematic material repeats often, possibly sounding repetitive. Okay, so that is a concern that you might want to consider, right? Because it's not just that this section is being repeated exactly a second time, it's also that this first section is composed of two groups of two, right? So essentially the same two bars are being repeated nearly exactly the same for, you know, four times. So it, it's just, you know, it's something that, that you, um, you might want to consider altering, you know, like here you're adding uh, a couple of notes couple of lower notes you're changing the bass trombone part slightly but it really isn't a it, it really isn't a C change it isn't a it isn't a um, C change is the wrong word it isn't really a, like a something that really changes the scope or the or the nature um, in any way of the of the two different groups it's just a, a very minor change so I mean there are a bunch of different ways of doing this I mean, you could just lighten up the first statement and then leave the second statement heavier or you could make the second statement even heavier or you could change something about the texture or some other kind of thing that's more you know that, that feels natural but you know ends up with slightly differentiated parts right um yeah so like if you've got an accented staccato that's already essentially a staccatissimo right because there's a there's a certain um, connotation of punchiness to it. So like, so I would say 
an accented staccatissimo is too much. An accented staccato and actually this is a comma, right? It kind of looks like um, it kind of looks like a staccatissimo next to all the other ones. So yeah, um, we may have a few too many uh, articulation marks in here. I think um, I don't think you need this pausa in here, you know. Bum, 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 uh, 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 uh. Right? There's a there's a there's a little bit of um you know, like here you like you're placing the second beat. I mean I can I can see the rationale, like you're thinking like a conductor. And I think, think that's very creditable, but it's it it may be just a little too too much hands-on. It's almost like putting handlebars on your handlebars, right? Or putting training wheels on the bicycle. I think that you can trust the players to get certain things right. So I don't think you need the commas here, right? I don't think you need that, right? And they, and especially like coming right after staccatissimos, you know, you can tell like my eyesight is not all that good and I, I, I mistook one for the other. Yeah, and some of them kind of don't, you know, I just, you know... It doesn't make sense to me. I think you can take take them all out. All right, um, but like just looking at the orchestration of the parts right in here, um, we've got these. I would say that if you have um, um, if you have grace notes, then don't take this sort of Stravinsky approach. Of the, like the all down bows, right? Just let the players figure it out, um, because like they may they may want to do more up bows, right? Just like that might maybe fits the way that the um, that the uh, that the grace note is played better. And it's also a little unclear the way that this is scored, which grace note is going to what part, right? So if you have one grace note and it's followed by two notes, then you should have um, two voices here, right? If it's divisi, right? So which, which part is the grace note going to? Is it going to both, right? In which case you should still have two parts, but you should have a grace note, um, a grace note with the, with two different stems, right? And then two different, uh, slurs, right? So it, it just, it's just really unclear the way that this is scored. And I would just say, you know, repeated grace note accents with all down bows. It just, you know, I mean, it just, you know, it just feels kind of ridiculous. I'm, I'm sort of, but I'm air bowing here. I mean, yeah, it's totally playable, but it's just, I don't know. It's just kind of weird. So, yeah, I mean, look, this, as a back and forth right in here, I feel that's way stronger, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, it just feels stronger to me. The grace notes kind of get in the way of that kind of, universal kind of shoving feeling you know of the of the um of all of the down bows in a row all right um but yeah you know generally speaking you know the scoring is all right if you are you know, bum 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 i see like you've got these sort of different You've got these different functions within. You've got different articulations too. I, I try to make that a uniform articulation. Yeah. Okay. Um, but you know, generally speaking, it works all right. Okay. Then we're moving on to our next criterion here, which is. Um, Melodic development soaring quite high, accompaniment figures covering a wide range. All right, so uh, so why, like, all right, so the problem here is everything is going to drop, right, except for the violins are going to go up, all right. So the problem here is that the the piccolo is should be an octave lower. So th this B should start down here, and then you can just go straight up. Instead of right? 
And then here you're pushing your flutes all the way up to high D. Yeah, so it's just, and, there, and there's some really high, yeah, there's some really high trumpet scoring here. This high C sharp, this D. Yeah, just really, really, you, you know, like, I think that you could score a lot of your heavy brass scoring down an octave and then, or, or just rearrange the voicing of the chord. And then like the implication of the overtones would do the work for you above, right? And, and you know, some of these things like you've got, you've got piccolo, high G's and F's. And then you've got your oboes on these high F's and E's. I, I think this could be mixed around a little bit. Doubling piccolo with the first flute and then doubling the first oboe with the second flute on E and then leave out the second oboe. And then I think that would actually be stronger. And, you know, a, in terms of intonation, a, a nice, more nicely balanced. Yeah. Okay, but yeah, I just yeah, the, I think that the the curve needs to be worked out. And and like the problem here is like you're dropping down a seventh in your piccolo part, which is really really audible. Like you you'll hear this very very high scoring and then suddenly dropping down. And at the same time that you're dropping down there, you will hear the oboes dropping down, right? Which are kind of being pushed way too high. I mean, look at how high you're going with your oboe right in there, you know, um, all the way up to G. It's just a very, very high place to go. And see, and like here, you're adding a breath mark to that. Um, yeah, just simplify things. Knock the oboes down an octave or, or this part, maybe give this part to a different instrument or something. If you have A2 flutes here, you do not need to throw the oboe all the way up there. Yeah, that, that's unnecessary, right? But even if it, even if that weren't a problem, the drop down a seventh of both of these instruments will be audible while you're trying to create the illusion that the line is going all the way up to the A and then jumping up to D and coming down, right? That's the, we want the sense that the line is all moving the same direction. So if instruments inside the line are compromising by jumping down and they all do it at once, then we can really hear it, right? Or if, if, if enough instruments do the same drop down at once then it's very obvious in the in the context of the scoring but yeah but don't drive your don't send your your oboes sky high like this without really really good cause and without time for them to prepare and all this other kind of stuff you know i say going up to f is cool g is just really pushing it you know f sharp and g and then g sharp and just like like the higher you like with every half step it is like a mountain uh, technique, purpose, talent, um, strain, all these other factors, right? So I would say just like your casual, don't, you know, keep your casual notes F at the highest and really make sure that you have a reason to go up to that F. If you're, if you are doubling like um, strings with the oboes and going up to F, that's cool because like the, the strings will kind of cover the thinness. And then G, I mean, a lot of ob oboists can go up to G, but some of them, it's just a real hassle. And it, you know, in light of other things that they have to do in the concert, it's just really an unnecessary thing, or they have to have a special read in order to go up there and all this other stuff. So just really, you know, lighten up on the skyscraping oboe playing. I've got a, I've got a, uh, a video, um, stratospheric oboe solos, I think it's called. So just, yeah, just check that out. It'll, it'll sit. I don't, I don't need to go into all this again, but yeah. All right. Um, yeah, but I mean, this high E is totally fine. All right now. So let's just stick with that melody. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. And so like, once again, starting off really, really high. What if this were down an octave, right? So, um, you know, and then, uh, and then you don't have to have this gap right in here. I, this just absolutely no need to have this gap. Everybody can breathe through this. That's fine. So the place to breathe is going to be right here. Do you see what I mean? Like that um, dotted rhythms. So just imagine this is a dotted rhythm. 
um, dotted rhythms are the perfect place to sneak a breath. So it's right here, and you don't even have to write it in, right? So the the player has got you know, play, the player has got somewhere to breathe. It's all right. But I would say just don't have the piccolo so high, and then you can have that same continuity of line, which I was saying was a problem here, right? So you can have that same continuity of line going all the way to the top. And I'd say, yeah, you know, with the flutes, they're fine the way they are. You can have them drop down here. Yeah, but yeah, just don't go that high. And this is fine, you know, taking your taking your strings way, way up high, just be aware that they are going to be kind of screechy, right? It's, it's a little strange here. You've got you've got everybody stopping on this note and then you've got a fermata here and then here you have quarter note fermata so you know it, you're really going to hear this you know da 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 it just really it's going to be piercing i would say make every make everybody do the same thing right and because otherwise the conductor has less control over this fermata than than he would otherwise, right? Or than they would otherwise. So, um, yeah. Hmm. All right, now moving on. I like how the uh, the melody makes its way through the other wind instruments. Now, it, it will not have that much of a different kind of degree in, in the actual sound because of the doubling from the strings. Now, the, 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 the doubling will feel a little different each time, but uh, unless the strings were to drop out, we wouldn't really hear a big difference between the different timbres right in here. But, I mean, other than that, it's, it's all fine. Uh, now here, just you are piling on the energy. Just you know, here I like the main concern is my, maintaining the driving staccato, transitioning smoothly into the next passage. And I actually feel that you know, even though you you really increase the intensity here, the you pull off into mezzo forte, and that works really nicely, right? But I think I think it's kind of not balanced. Like you have so much weight right here, forte. In your winds, but you know who's carrying on the action here: strings and brass. And um, you, you know, and the, like, and the and the strings are going to be outplayed by the brass at mezzo forte. So why don't you end here on an eighth note, right? Have everybody end on an eighth, and the strings diminuendo to forte here, right? And then there can be a better balance between these two groups, especially throwing in all these accents, right? I mean, accented trumpet part is like molto forte compared to the strings, right? So maybe you can ease up on the accents a little bit. Okay, but uh, it's, you know, it's it's probably more weight than you need the way that this is scored. And and of course the strings are not going to contribute very much because of the so much so many higher notes in the in the winds that they're really and and of course the way that this uh, this horn is scored right in here. Now I'm I'm not gonna get into the it's just a it's a little too much to get into the into all of the things that need work in the horn section, but I'm just gonna jump back one page and check something. Yeah, okay. Alright, so so you're not really specific about you know about how you you're scoring everything but just by the way you're suggesting here one here and two here it's you know you you are obviously scoring things so that this is the first and third and that's the that is the the second and fourth and i mean it's okay uh, it's all playable uh, the problem is that with this kind of scoring there will never be an intimate relationship between the first and the second, right? Now here you got them scoring octaves and so on. Okay, great. But there still is, you know, there's there still is kind of a problem in in just like the that intimate relationship between the two players isn't a um, isn't a natural thing visually on the score. So just really watch out for that. 
All right, so we're getting to this part. Bum, 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 yeah, da, 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 da. And this is very cool coming in here with bassoon and English horn. Yeah, bah, da, 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 da. That works really nicely, uh, with and especially the doubling that you got on the strings. And, you know, and just a little beep right in there. And, of course, the big concern for this passage going forward in B is that there is, uh, you have to maintain a differentiation uh, in closely spaced melodies, overlapping accompany figures, highlighting the inner voices, and so on. And you do that really nicely in here. There's also the concern of contrast of color, breadth of texture. You address those things as well, and especially really nicely going forward. But well, I'll get to that in a second. Um, <clears throat> then continuing on. Right, and then it's kind of the same thing again. And I would say like the contrabassoon under here is just going to be massive, the, 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 the thickness of it. Uh, you know, doubling this and then of course in, in octaves with the, um, with your cellos and violas and English horn and, and everybody else here, right? The English horn and bassoon doubling and the contrabassoon from below. I mean, it's a neat idea on how to keep everybody engaged and very simple, effective scoring. However, um, I, I'm not sure why the we have like kind of different uh, dynamic scoring here, right? Like the, here, there's no crescendo, and we have mezzo forte to forte. And then here we have uh, crescendo to fortissimo in these parts, but not in the English horn part, right? Shouldn't the English horn part? Crescendo to fortissimo here. Maybe it was a copy paste error with the dynamics or something. I don't know. Anyway, um, oh, one of the other things over these eight bars to watch out for is the high interjecting notes and like continuing and just kind of getting repetitive and so on. And I, and I feel that you work those in just to the to the kind of the the structure of how the music was working and and it. And it did not become an issue, so there's nothing to critique about that. Um, it, just these like really, really high little piccolo notes might not be necessary, right? But I mean, the, it's it's still. I mean, thank goodness you didn't put up put it up an octave, right? <laughs> but you know, it works the way that it is. You don't really need to change anything. Um, but I mean, I would just think like, you know, if it if it starts to get on your nerves with repeated listenings, then maybe that's something to change. All right. And that takes us to Yararam. Um, and this is really interesting how you're going. Dun, 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 dun. You're tying across the bar line. This is, I think, the first I've seen this in, in an arrangement uh, um, of this score. Yeah, I mean, I mean the the overall effect is to 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 slightly pull at the momentum of each downbeat. Da, 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 da. Yeah, and, and and you're trying to you're trying to affect that um, um kind of dividing it between. But uh, see, I'm not sure if that works. But uh, that uh, yeah, I. You see, you're trying to get this. It's it's I don't know. It's a it's a weird way to do it. I'm not totally sold on it. Right, and we have like this a similar thing going on here, um, trombone and bass trombone. And then of course, like we have that sort of realized in cellos and violas, um, quite 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 wide apart. Do you know what I mean? Um, Yeah. Yeah, I'm not totally sold on that, but but I mean I think that the thing that will possibly hurt this in the end is the difference in articulation styles between parts. And also like the fact that these that this interpretation of the triplet is is not smooth, right? You know, it's like it 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 doesn't have that it doesn't have that downward flow. And I would say, you know, just because you cannot realize it in the violin part doesn't mean that it wouldn't work beautifully starting from middle C 
to B and then down to E in the violas, right? It would there there is absolutely no need to compromise anything, right? And I mean, bass clarinet, boom, yeah, easy, really easy to do. B bassoon, same thing, bam, 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 bam. I mean, they could do that all day long. So there's really like, uh, um, like with English horn as well, right? So there, so there are some instruments that cannot go that far. Right, and of course, like here, you're really pushing it down into the into the very nasal, extremely nasal part of the um, of your oboes, and you're having them play ah two. So like ah two oboes way down there in that basement part. Maybe this, maybe you should just change it to like second oboe or first oboe. But I mean, you know, I mean, in terms of the whole issue of like. Uh, you know, keeping the triplets from overwhelming the melodic line, widely reaching the left, you know, the widely reaching left hand patterns being effectively interpreted. I, I mean, yeah, pretty much. That's pretty much working. So I, I can't fault you for that. Um, it's just, I mean, yeah, you know, your clarinets, you keep your clarinets and, and bass clarinet in the background so that they don't interfere um, it's it's really it is very very um very fussy dynamics in here you know very um it's like dynamic mixing you know like turning things up and down on a mixing board um so i would just say in general like it's better to like in symphonic scoring i mean maybe it's different in in film scoring but in symphonic scoring in you know, in concert scoring, it's really better to have more general dynamics across all parts and just to have the registers of the instruments do the work, right? But yeah, I mean, the like for instance here, the sound of the piccolo will get swallowed into the sound of everything else going on around it. So like you get a little bit of shine on top, but it, you know, it, it won't necessarily contribute all that much. But the clarinets being in the background and not interfering with the statement of the melody continuing on in the horns that's very important right and the and the second violins i think you can i think you should have uniform articulation marks on all these parts and i think accent is too much i think um i think a um a tenuto mark works better all right and this is so cool right in here this continuation right in yeah it's just yeah bum 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 um uh, one of the one of the one of the little things about this that i mentioned in the um in my uh evaluation criteria keeping the textural contours fresh and not too much the same right so um, you do make some adjustments as you go along and they're quite you know, like for their, like just in terms of minutia, like and just really paying attention to the different little tiny color color changes, they are cool, but they're not really all that different, right? So, uh, continuing, you know, continuing on with this, like you just have to really count on the the overall beautiful quality of the scoring staying interesting. You know that like it is. The, the general thing that you're doing here is interesting for its own sake, right? And and so that the um, that relying on changes and innovation are not a not an issue. But I mean, you know, it's just something to think about, right? Now here you're changing to three and four, and then one and two, and three and four, and so on. And you don't you don't need to do that. A single horn player can carry this on. And the same thing, you know, you can you can have your first and second playing in octaves all the way through here. It is not an issue. I would say don't make the change. It's fine. And especially like if you you know, if you're doing a changeover in the middle of a of a hairpin, it doesn't make any sense, right? Because like the player will be getting to the you know, they'll get halfway through their mezzo piano and then all of a sudden it's the other players coming in on half mezzo piano to going to piano. I mean, it, you know, just really unclear, right? So a little bit of, of tidying up to do there. Okay, so now we get to C. 
and convincing all our Gondo expansion. I think you just almost got it there, right? The one thing that you are not taking into account possibly is the pedal mark that I left in the score, right? So the, the meaning of which, um, which I'm sure that you are aware of this, is that as the pianist plays each successive tone up the piano, the each tone will tie and keep holding into the next bar, right? Or until the pedal lifts into the next bar. So some of these, like it, you're, you are conscious of some of those pitches and you hold some of them, but you don't with all of them, right? So I think that, I think that like just maintaining the sense of interest and push and everything else. And then here, this is like, why are we going to mezzo piano here and pianissimo here? It doesn't quite make sense to me. Shouldn't it be everything diminuendo to piano here, right? And then, I, I mean, I I see like this is part of the melody, yeah, sure. But it, but shouldn't everything go down to piano and then piano crescendo, mezzo piano crescendo on these parts and so on? Yeah. And you can you can have everybody go crescendo to forte, especially right up here with your flutes, because your flutes like you know they they really will get overwhelmed by the sound of the uh, of the strings right in here. So they should all be they should all be crescendo to forte. And and you're missing a crescendo here on the bass clarinet part. Okay, so now we're getting to the real meat past. Uh, past the double bar. And this is this is really nicely done. You know, the the interpretation. The only issue that I had with it is just really like um you know uh doppio pulento ma sempre moso, right? So it's like half as fast but a little more, right? So half as fast, you're giving us half as fast, but a little less, right? So, so interpreting from the tempo that you had your mock-up set at right in here, and if we go back a little, we can see that, yeah, you know, you're pretty much uh, kind of following the same tempo that I set down. Okay, and then, but yeah, so I would just say that it needs to speed up a little. And then going on, I mean, I, I, I won't bother pointing this out when we get there, but, but going on, there are you throw in a lot of uh, rhythmic nuances, and that's great. Some of them are really stretched and obvious. You know, they're obvious ritardandos, accelerandos, and so on. And and if they're going to be that obvious, then you need to put them in. You need to mark them, rather than just like the the kind of um, inflections that I had in the mock-up. Right? That you know, when they are, if the tempo is slower, then they really become exaggerated, and you have to put them in. You have to mark them into the score. And, and I mean, I like I, I some of this things I these things I'm mentioning as if you're going to go ahead and like get this performed. And you know the reason for that is I hope that you do. You know, wouldn't it be great if all these scores got a chance to be performed or even just read? You know, by anything from a community orchestra to a top professional orchestra. So I mean, I have no way of pulling that off for you guys. I'm sorry, <laughs> um, man. I wish I had an orchestra in my back pocket and they had you know, a couple of months just to run through all of your scores and, and get them not just like a read through, but just perform each of them really, really well. <clears throat> but, you know, while I'm at it, I'd like a pony. I'd like um, a year's supply of, uh, of food shipped to my door, and I'd like world peace. So uh, with that, let's move on. Oboe, solo, um, and this is beautifully done. I think it's a beautiful register for this solo, it's, you know, in this this sort of bustling uh, accompaniment. That's all sounding great, okay? So when we go into the next page, we can talk a little bit about the concern that I have in my own scoring. Keeping accompaniment pattern from becoming too regular and therefore too predictable, right? So you do you do some changes in there. Like for instance, you've got like the, you say ah two clarinets here. And you know, here's where I would trade off between instruments. I would have, 
um, I would have the first clarinet play the first bar and then trade off uh, dovetail on the first note of the next bar to second clarinet. And then you could go A2 here. <clears throat> and whenever you have that kind of dovetail thing, it's good to add, like to since they're going to have separate parts, pianissimo to, um, to I just like, like say, piano, and then piano crescendo to mezzo forte. So like, because the, because your, um, if you do split it up the way I'm saying, because your your second player is going to come in and you know they're going to have half of a, you know they're going to have half of a crescendo mark. So it doesn't make any sense. You decide how how far they're going to to go crescendo by here and then write it in with two separate um, two separate uh, hairpins. All right, so that really does really does help it from becoming too regular. And as to the other concern, careful treatment of the melodic voice to make it feel authentic to the composer's style, I would say that, that it is, except like you're missing, uh, in, in all of these parts, you're missing nuances, right? Do you see what I'm saying? Like I'm singing this with different nuances to the dynamic in my voice. You know, I mean, like, you have to tell the player how, you know, like, put in some hairpins, right? Like, getting louder and softer and so on, just like adding the nuances. You can you can go with a different flow. I mean, that's a very folk thing. It's like when you when the pitch goes up, the dynamic gets louder, and when it goes down, it gets softer and so on. Or you can, you know, you can crescendo going downhill to, to sort of, you know, like, for instance, here, I would make this a crescendo. So, yeah, so, so add more nuances. Like, you know, the, you don't, there are no lyrics here, so you have to make the music lyrical with some guidance. Now, here, I felt that this is one of the best or one of the better um interpretations of this yeah bup, 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 deet and dutton. you know what i mean it's like you're you are throwing in this um you know, these 16th notes which are so aggressive and so you know they're just so powerful but i would say like um yeah the crescendo just doesn't quite get there you know what i mean it, uh, i would say crescendo to mezzo forte at least within all parts um you know and then and also this bite right in here arf, you know Yeah, don't 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 hold a you know don't hold a lid over it. And some of this doesn't really make sense. You have piano, and then you have mezzo forte in your cellos, but your violas are still piano, right? So I think a little bit of proofreading of dynamics in here is indicated. Yeah, and then and then like bring up this accompaniment. Yeah, da 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 Bring that up to mezzo forte, and um, let your your melody instruments speak at forte, right? And the, and the same thing here. Um, yeah, looking at the score. Uh, yeah, there's a... Looking at the score, there's a... Um, there actually isn't a diminuendo. You put... Or you, you sort of change the dynamic here. I would say, make this a forte, not a, not a mezzo forte. Right. That way, you just keep it a little bit above the other instruments, and then the same thing in here, forte, on this, just because of the all of the crossing lines, and then this rise up here. Okay, so what's going on here? Is this the first trumpet? Right. So you need a a nice slur over the top, so we that helps the copyist decide. Right. But I, I'd say if you're going to go up to this high B. Then, then don't do this. Ba ba ba. You know it's 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 hard. It's it's enough to just go F sharp F sharp B, right? But I mean, you've already got the clarinets on that high. I mean, I don't know if you really need the first trumpet up there, right? I don't know. All right, sounding A, of course. Now here is where the music really gets accordion-like, right? I said I would point it out, and, and it's because you have got your 
clarinets in octaves. So uh, in my, I think it's the 104 orchestration course on Mac Pro Video, I have an example of clarinets playing in octaves. It's kind of the hornpipe section uh, from one of the Mahler symphonies. And you know, just really, you know, with the with the clarinets playing exposed in octaves like that, you just really get that pungent, pungent sound. And then, like on either side, <laughs> you've got the flute, uh, the flutes accompanying the first, um, the first clarinet, and you've got the uh, the trumpets doubling the second clarinet, and that just um, underlines that quality, right? So if you don't like that quality then you know what what you're hearing in your mock up then then i would say just just choose a different kind of of octave doubling there but if you want that like real kind of bandonian kind of um uh almost accordion like sound then then you've got it right there now of course this is continuing on the um that whole concern about um, keeping the accompaniment pattern from being too regular. So I think like adding the horns in here. Uh, now here, ah too, that's completely unnecessary. That would be really, really heavy. But I, I think you should have these maybe, um, um, like what, what would be nice here would be like a nice little portato, like mm, 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 rather than dun, 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 dun. It just sounds a little bit too much like Jaws, right? So a portato would be nice, and, and it would also match the da -da 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 that nice um, uh, measured tremolo that you've got in your uh, in your string parts. Dun, 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 dun. Once again, like nuances. I thought this was nice and effective, right in here. The um, if you're going to double the English horn with the second flute so low, it's just the the second flute will basically just disappear right in here. And especially when when they are, you know, you you've also got the um, the okay high bassoons playing a two. So yeah, you know, plus the English horn. Okay, so this is really going to have a very, very strongly reedy sound in here. And uh, this, this is something that I really avoid, by the way, myself. Exposed high bassoons in their tenor register playing A2, right? Because it, just what comes out almost immediately is the um, is any imperfection in intonation and articulation and phrasing is just immediately exposed to the world. Now here, you're kind of doing this rule of three thing here, or rule of four even, with having four players, like the, the second flute, the uh, English horn, like the second flute will just get swallowed up by the sound of all these reed instruments in here. Uh, but you know, you notice that like the, the sort of sense of accordion-ness really kept going, right? Like we had that kind of very reedy sound here. Well, it, the reedy sound you're hearing in your mock-up will also, it's also fairly true because of what I was talking about, that sort of triple, uh, that A3 uh, reed sound that you've got in here. So I would just say like, uh, I'm not saying that to not do it, okay, because it might be really, really effective. I would just say use caution, right? Just really be, be aware that at least A2 uh, bassoons way up high like that is is problematic and then you know will adding english horn there uh, will it stabilize them or will it make things worse so on, only you know only you can answer that or you know or a few double read players but i you know i just feel that the you know starting from a forte diminuendo the the second flute has just basically got nothing right in here. Now here, you're getting to this, like everything being played very soft and that at this point it balances out, right? So by around right in here, the second flute has got more of a chance to do something. But you know, which is what concerns me is that you've got this, this stuff going on in here, crossing those voices with the clarinet. And I just feel that the the flute is at the most vulnerable right in here. So you know the doubling of the English horn will 
will support it, but it, you know, but it may just become about the English horn being the, the, the quality in there that keeps the, the first clarinet from, uh, from overwhelming things. So I, you know, I mean, I'm just a little dubious about all these separated notes, no slurs or, you know, no articulation style, or I'm, I'm just a little worried about it. Bum, 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 ba -da -da -dum. As we're getting to the end, man managing the sense of restraint. I thought that was very nicely done. And then, yeah, I'm a little unsure why things drop out right when they get exciting. You know, like, dun, 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 dun. nothing. Right? So you have this mighty expression right in here, and things sort of drop out. I mean, look, it kind of works, I, I, the arrangement. Yeah, I'm just still not, not totally sure about it. Yeah. You know, and then you've got that really high, you know, you're taking your trumpets up to high C and so on. I mean, that's totally playable, but, you know, just being aware that, that, you know, and also you're sending up your first trumpet player to to high B flat when you've already got your second and third and you know who should be going up to to high C is your first trumpet player right that's that's what they're there for um so I would say probably a better way to score this first trumpet on top second and third on the bottom and then a two trombones here on the on the lower line rather than sending your first trombone player all the way up there. I mean, that's totally playable, but it's just that the other solution is more musical. All right, and this is nice. Dun, 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 dun. Now, okay, what's tricky about this is like everybody will have to be watching the conductor. The conductor will have to be cueing the exact nuance if you want like the same effect that's going on in the piano part. You know, dun, 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 Da -da -da -dum. You know, like, like they will have to be watching the conductor like a hawk. He is going to be, like, if this is really, like, if you want that just pinpoint accuracy, everybody just to follow exactly on time, they are all going to have to have the same notion ahead of time, and the conductor is going to have to conduct it exactly that way every single time, right? Rehearsal and concert. Uh, I think that the oboe players have got almost no, no weight at all in here. But I mean, th th that's okay. Don't take them out. But you know, against a three trumpets, they really have very little chance of being heard. But still, you know, I mean, the color and it's also fun for them, right? And yeah, all of this so fun. The way that you involve so many uh, lower winds. <laughs> You know, th this is like a, a section where I've been telling people, oh, you need more weight or, you know, you need more things happening here or that needs to be more judiciously scored. And uh, I would say right in here, like, you just probably don't need so much of the, you know, the basses could probably just play the first couple notes or, and then come back down. I don't think you need to send them all the way scorching way, way high up here to this, you know, really high E flat. I think that's totally unnecessary. In fact, you could just start off, like, I, I would say maybe managing things, like scoring things exactly the way that you've got it here in the, well, no, see, that won't work either. Yeah, you know what? No, no, it will work. Contrabassoon, just just, just have them do the contrabassoon part and take away the, the tenor clef. And I think that that's the solution right in here. Because it's not, <coughs> it's not really helping, you know, um, it's just really kind of insane for your double basses in here. <coughs> okay, but I just love, you know, the A3 trumpets in here. <laughs> uh, octaves with the trombones. Why didn't you throw in the bass trombone here? No, that's all right. You didn't have to. All right. Right. Yeah, it's all good. And then here, all right, you have a triple beam tremolo here. And then you have a triple beam tremolo 
under a beam. So go to a double beam tremolo here. Just a just that's the that is the standard thing to do there, right? Because every beam adds a time value, right? <coughs> or makes makes the time value go in half, right? So if you have a triple beam on a quarter note, then you have a double beam under an eighth note beam, right? So so you still have three beams, including the the beam of the eighth note. All right, and this is all fine. See, we're getting into the whole problem of reinterpreting very low, very fast broken octaves to be playable on instruments of that range, and you know you choose to just basically keep it in the bassoons and the and the uh, lower strings. <clears throat> okay, uh, here's a problem though. Uh, bassoons single tongue rather than double tonguing, right? So they have to go. You just try doing that fast, right? So the best thing to do is to just give each bassoonist a few notes and then have them trade off. I'd say five at the most, right? So they can all do that, right? So and then trade trade off and so on, right? Every every couple of beats, have them trade off, and then you will get like a nice, fine, precise thing, or just have them. Have them all play staccato together on this, and and don't and do not do the um, the measured tremolo. <coughs> all right, so here we're getting to maintaining the rather hallucinatory feeling of the music, despite fairly straightforward uh, building blocks of our of our tutti right in here. And I mean, I feel this is all really nicely done, you know, and like the just sort of the call and response between the, it's actually not call and response, the, uh, the back and forth between the two parts. Now, this is kind of insane, your trumpet scoring here. <coughs> See, the problem here is that, you know, it all looks fine and dandy, but you know what is what is really going to happen is that just for one bar, your trumpet player is going to just scream, right? It's just gonna it's gonna be like a like a jazz solo right in here, right? And then and you're marking it mezzo forte. No way, you're gonna go up to high D. That's gonna be forte or louder, right? So all of a sudden you have your trumpet just screaming up here, and then you're going back to normal, right? So. Uh, yeah, it's, it's this is just not working out. Keep it in lower octaves. Otherwise, you're never going to hear this the strings right in here. And you're messing up your whole dynamic arc, right? You're going poco a poco crescendo, right? So piano, mezzo piano, mezzo forte, forte. So if you really want this bar to be mezzo forte, don't throw in this high octave here. But yeah, but the, you know, like changing to this, uh, 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 I just really like this right in here. And then like the use of the timpani to emphasize the syncopation. I thought that was great. I don't even think you need to throw in this downbeat here on the timpani. Yeah. Yeah, it's just so nice. Like the, this is really solid scoring in the, in the 2T. Just really no problems. Keeping the strings in octaves, letting the winds throw in the harmony. I mean, it just yeah, it just really is you know, textbook in a good way, and just really this rock solid, uh, rock bottom um, scoring right in here. I think that the uh, um, this is all playable on on bass trombone, but I think maybe it's just better to do octaves here. And I think in the piano score, the way that that it alternates between lower and and higher scoring i think that that's something like see like you've got that the sort of a semblance of that happening here in your lower winds and lower brass but like you don't do that in your lower strings so i think i think you need to adjust that right so just have your cellos <coughs> um have your cellos and double basses uh start an octave higher just just like the you know just basically just replicate what you've got here in your bassoons, right? It's totally fine. And then I would I would say like same thing with your with your bass trombone and tuba. You don't need this much weight on the bottom line. Put the um, 
put the bass trombone up an octave so it's doubling your bassoons and your cellos uh, as I proposed you moving everything up and then um, and then here you don't need to drop it so rock bottom just have them play an octave higher you know play have them play in this range right and then just go back and forth between those two and I think it's just a it's just much more secure maybe that's too regular for you but I mean still it's I think it's just the the strongest solution there all right, and that takes us towards this ending part. Um, at just nicely done. Ba, ba, da, 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 da. Did you notice the beautiful power of the uh, of the uh, trumpets right in here, and the trombones? And nothing was really pushed all that high, was it? You know, it just was really strong. It had a beautiful, bright sound. Supported the. Um, the winds up here and everything else, right? There's really kind of no need to. Um, there's kind of no need for the um, for the trumpets to to like do any paint peeling notes. And they can they, the the sound the higher sound the the sound up up an octave is implied, right? There's the strength of the trumpet's tone starts an octave higher than its fundamental note, right? Any fundamental note, the overtones from it are stronger uh, up an octave and up an octave from that. So so there's already the implication of a, of a higher pitch right in the trumpet's timbre. So you don't need to score so many incredibly high notes with it. The same thing is true of horns as well. Now I'm just going to flick back <clears throat> There's one other thing I think I could help you with. <clears throat> now, like here, your piccolo scoring, it really takes us very, very high when we get to here, and then, like, all of a sudden we're back down where we were. And the question is, do you really need a piccolo part in here at all, right? Is it possible that these Gs could be played an octave lower? And then this could be played an octave lower along with this. And the piccolo part could just be like your third flute part. And then you could just have, a, you know, a two, a three kind of scoring on that upper line. Because, you know, certainly right in here, this is all really kind of weak stuff for your piccolo player. I mean, right in here, like admittedly, you get a kind of a folk flute sound from the piccolo. And the piccolo is you know, pretty audible right in here, but, you know, there's just so much going on. It's just sort of like the upper, you know, it, it sort of feels like an overtone where you've got it scored here. So, I mean, it, you know what would be much more clear here? It would just be a normal flute part, right? So say that this was the first flute part, and then the player who's playing this part as you scored it now were actually was actually playing A2 with the second flute below, right? And then that gives it more, that gives that flute part more security so that it can continue to play uh, in unison with your first violins and then the second violins can be supported by the um, by the clarinets and bassoons right so anyway you know maybe the the piccolo could just change to third flute is what i'm saying and then you can just reformat the way that some of this is because like all of these pitches in here could be or will just sound way stronger on on a standard flute. Anything below D or E flat in uh, in in the staff, any written note in the staff for the piccolo, it is just you know is really not all that strong. And especially when this massive mighty tutti with lots of trumpet notes, you know, like the trumpet notes, even though they're not getting all that high the overtones of them will still just knock out any of this sort of weaker piccolo playing. And like a standard flute would just add a lot more. All right, now here we've got a problem. Bum, 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 bum. Notice that this time value is going all the way to the second beat. But where does this pattern start? It starts on one and, right? Doodle -deedle -doodle -deedle -doodle -deedle. So I can't hear the beginning here. You also have the problem that the this massive chord here, 
will be so strong, will be so powerful that the wash of reverb from the chord will just fill the concert hall, right? Especially with this timpani below and the tuba and bass trombone. So, um, <clears throat> there are two solutions which you should use, and you should use both of them. Okay, one is you should have all of these time values of the downbeat here, turn them all into eighth notes. Bum, 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 bum. And then throw it in a pausa, like a little comma, right? Or a chisora is just a little too long, but dun, 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 dun. And then the conductor lets the reverb settle slightly in the hall and then continues on, kind of gives us just a slight preparation. Da, 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 right? So just start in, and then these pitches here can also start on the half a beat. And this is kind of interesting, mezzo forte and... So, I mean, if you really want these as separate notes, I think you need to write in detaché. Just really make them separated. This is kind of strange. I think making the making the harmony note right in here one degree louder than the uh, than the melody. I'm not I'm not I'm not in love with that. Yeah, I think they should all be the same dynamic level in all parts. Okay. And then going back to this, da -da 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 if you're going to go to forte here, if your balance here was fortissimo against mezzo forte, forte against mezzo piano. All right, and then it just makes perfect sense continuing on mezzo piano. Da -da 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 -da. Ba -ba 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 -bum -bum. And then here, like what? Piano to forte? Mezzo piano to mezzo forte? Okay, so what is mezzo, for mezzo piano to mezzo forte? It's like going from blah to bleh, right? You're going from like chartreuse to beige, right? <laughs> we want to go from chartreuse to red, right? Or we want to go, you know, from blue to, you know, from blue to red. We don't want to go from, you know, from from uh, mauve to pink, you know what I mean? We, we really want some kind of, and you've got an accent in there too, right? So look, just let it all be crescendo to mezzo forte, or excuse me, crescendo to forte here in all parts. All right, and then I love the transition to this. That's really beautiful. Would have loved to hear or love to see what you did with E. But anyways, those are my suggestions and <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think that this score is really, really cool. You know, despite the fact I've been picking it apart, uh, but I mean, that's why you sent it to me, right? So that I could uh, give you my feedback and help you get it ready for the stands if you decide to have an orchestra play this. And, you know, as I've mentioned before, it would be great <laughs> if um, somewhere out there, some of these uh, scores, I mean, all of these scores in a, in a perfect world, but if some of these scores got performed and... Now, this is definitely one of those which is more ready for the stands than the average, right? So, uh, I mean, if anything I said makes sense, and maybe it makes sense to you in a way that is that reveals to you what you could do even better than my suggestion. That would actually be even better to me, right? Um, one last little sort of... Um, caution about you know about triple f if you haven't heard this perspective yet i'll just repeat it briefly and that is i feel that triple f is as loud as you can play on your instrument musically right so uh quadruple f is as loud as you can play on your instrument non-musically but still get a pitch and then quintuple f <laughs> is just basically just screaming with your instrument and it doesn't really matter what pitch it is, right? So, um, so just, just be careful, you know, this is in the piano score and that's great. And, and I think you should keep it in the, in the orchestral score, but just be aware of what that means for orchestral instruments, right?
So it's just really, people are just taking it all the way to the very limit. And, um, and that means that if they are going that loud, that is going to be something that just fills the concert hall and just really takes over everything. And to just suddenly drop down to this, the, the reverb in the hall will last till about right here, right? So this, the, you know, they'll, they'll miss half of this new idea. So that's why it's just, it's good to have like a little, like a little um, comma, right? Put, throw in a comma and have all of these notes end or have this, have this phrase come to an end on an eighth note. So it's just bum. And then, da -da 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 -da. so just just a slight placement of this. Like, you, you know, you you're very concerned with that, and I, you threw in what I felt to be unnecessary and unnecessary um, uh, fermata earlier on on the first screen, uh, just to sort of get the sense of placement, right? So here's that here's where you need it even more, right? So I'm I'm not saying that you have to throw that away, but the sense of placing the half beat right here is so important here and the, and everybody will get it just you know the only people I really have to pay any, atten any attention to it is the strings and they're right in front of the conductor they're watching the, his every move so or her every move so just being able to just really place that you know ba 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 da 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 it's like really there is a breath right in there uh, that allows the sound of the triple f to settle in the hall all right, I'm sorry. I'm just getting distracted by this. When I, when what I really want to do <laughs> is to thank you very, very much for uh, for bringing me this amazing score and giving me so much to talk about for more than an hour, and you, you know, and for for being such a great support on Patreon. And I mean, I can't wait to hear you know what you think about some of the other. Uh, scores in this category, the Brev category, it would really be great if all of my um, all of my Brev level supporters were able to uh, comment on each other's scores, give each other some positive feedback, and you know some constructive suggestions. Uh, it just just matters so much, and you know now we're kind of getting into the kind of make or break <laughs> period of this evaluation. Uh, section of the challenge where like I just have like a uh, like two or three dozen more scores to go uh, on my end and then you know and then like in you know not 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 counting the website evaluations but for that there's like I think about at this point in in my timeline there's about five more to go five more of those collections so we're just really getting down to the wire and if people can keep up the comments keep up the you know, just you know, talking to each other, thanking each other, commenting on each other's scores. That would just really be great. And and a score like this deserves the comments because you did a great job on this. I just, you know, I just I'm so blown away that people with this kind of talent are coming onto my group and supporting other composers' access to information about orchestration. At uh, just you know, every day I'm thankful for that. I, it is, I never take it for granted. So um, thank you so much. Thank you to everybody out there supporting on Patreon, all the website, uh, all the website subscribers, everybody subscribing to the channel, all the viewers, anybody who's still with us after um, almost 70 minutes of chat. I appreciate it so much. Thanks to you all.